Hi, my name is João and I've been working on UNIT, a monetary model that frames money as a public service. This is a speculative design project focused on a time span from 10 to 20 years from now, imagining future scenarios, evidencing through future artifacts, in the attempt of building a model that is adequate to face the challenges ahead. I mainly work on two overlapping scales, private transactions and public policies, using a process-driven methodology in which research and writing occupy a central role. In this presentation, I'll start by showing you why and how our monetary systems are broken. I'll then explain how UNIT addresses the problem and give you a glimpse into a speculative scenario where a government is using UNIT. And I'll finish with an overview of the design process that led to UNIT. So let's start with the definition of money. This video briefly describes the relevance of the social contract facets of money. But what is money? There are many monetary systems. Some use national currencies. Some operate with international currencies, like the euro and the US dollar, while other systems use cryptocurrencies. There are also forms of private money, like vouchers, stamp systems, casino chips, or even cloakroom number tickets, just to name a few. And even though different types of money have different purposes, they all enable some form of social contract. In today's mainstream monetary policies, this fact is one of the most neglected aspects of money. Money is not just a commodity, but it's also a social contract. For instance, Bitcoin upholds a contract between the Bitcoin owner and the rest of the blockchain, but is it adequate to fund the NHS through taxes? Casino chips, on the other hand, uphold a social contract between casinos and Las Vegas gamblers. But are they any good to pay at Nancy's grocery store? What about state money's social contract? Commonly, in state money's social contract, the governments commit to providing essential public services and infrastructure at the lowest cost possible for the citizen, while the citizens commit to obeying the state law and paying taxes in state money. Nowadays, in state money systems, money is almost always created and destroyed through fractional reserve banking by supramonetary institutions, for example banks. In this fractional reserve banking system, the central banks create the initial money supply and lend it to other banks, which in turn lend and expand that money supply to the wider public, the intramonetary agents, like private individuals, companies, and state departments. All of these loans are expected to be repaid with interests, but because the money to pay the interests is never created to start with, this creates a debt that is impossible to redeem. To keep the wheels of the economy rolling, central banks then issue more credit and the cycle continues, eternally increasing the global amount of unredeemable debt, which is now more than 322% of global GDP. This radical design flaw leads to an endemic, toxic, and competitive environment, as well as many other societal problems that prevent states to commit to their social contract. So, how might we create a mathematically viable form of state money? You need to Adding to what we've just seen, we're being handed a broken monetary system that causes regular moments of crisis, to which it only seems to respond by helping large corporations weather economic downturns leaving us unequipped to address urgent economic issues like inequality, for instance. The African Development Bank estimates that in 2021, the number of Africans living in poverty will reach one third of the population, an increase. In this slide, we can see three pictures of people living in poverty. None of these three pictures are from Africa. Poverty affects all continents. The current model is not designed to eliminate poverty. In fact, it seems like it's designed to perpetuate it. And this is absolutely shocking, especially when we know that money is a cultural construction. Why would anyone want to design and live with a system that inevitably accrues debt? All in all, unredeemable debt leads to bad politics. It erodes the social contract and the levels of trust. As a result, people are becoming increasingly skeptical about current policies. So new ideas have been dropping on the table. Two ideas have gained traction recently. On the one side, cryptocurrencies have been deemed as the next step of commodity money. They bring technological innovations that bypass the need for banks. On the other side, a claim for universal income is acknowledging money as a social contract and placing human welfare at the heart of economics. However, these ideas have yet to develop a well-rounded answer to the state money social contract. On the one hand, blockchain projects are not concerned with state policies. On the other hand, a universal basic income, if simply presented as a demand, fails to answer the question, how would you fund it without creating more unredeemable debt? 
So I've tried to combine some of the features of this model to design a form of money that is both mathematically viable and focused on a fair social contract. Introducing UNIT, a monetary model for the future of state money. UNIT can be implemented gradually alongside the current model. It contains a set of monetary mechanisms to keep prices stable, and contrary to the current system, UNIT creates money directly into citizens' account in form of basic income. So how does UNIT create money? Well, in three different ways. First, as said, through a basic income. A regular amount of units are created directly to all adults' current accounts to be spent at will. But we may ask, if everyone is given money, who would do all the work? Well, the second way unit has to create money is to create more money to reward the citizens who work for public services. This second way of creating money is here referred to as UBI, Universal Basic Income. The third way of creating money is through loans to allow citizens bigger purchases. So let's see how UNIT works in more detail. Well, instead of a bank, there's a server. This server is basically a smart ledger that creates and eliminates money according to a specific set of rules and registers transactions between users. Technically speaking, the server can be centralized or decentralized. Whatever the technology, what is crucial to UNIT is the social contract that it helps to enact which is to allow governments to fund their public programs and still allowing space for private initiative. To uphold this contract, UNIT allows public and private organizations to increase their workers' income in different ways. For instance, for the public sector, because public services should be free and cannot therefore derive profit, public workers are paid an additional fee to incentivize work on essential sectors. This additional fee is under this system referred to as public premium. In contrast, private organizations cannot receive such public premiums, so individuals and companies are free to charge whatever they want and use profit to increase their revenues. On top of this, all citizens and organizations can ask for loans, and since everybody is granted a basic income, there is no risk of credit defaults for reasonable sized loans. But if we keep creating money, what's stopping from losing its value? Indeed, we need a way to control the amount of money. Instead of pegging it to gold, limiting it to a random number, or even increasing the difficulty of mining it, UNIT keeps it tied to the amount of citizens that exist and eliminates it according to its use. I've prepared two short videos to illustrate this from a user perspective. This video succinctly explains how UNIT creates and destroys money to keep prices stable. Inflation control. This is Noah, a citizen of State X, which is using UNIT to provide all its citizens a regular basic income. To prevent currency devaluation, UNIT programmatically eliminates older units allowing prices to remain stable. But who controls this program? Well, the states do. Besides defining a basic income, states define five other parameters to keep currency value stable. These parameters are a maximum accumulation of units on the citizen's current accounts, the lifespan of units on those current accounts, how much money a citizen can park on their savings account, the maximum a state can accumulate to fund public programs, and a small tax fee that all citizens pay. Let's look at how unit flows, from currency creation to currency elimination, to help us understand what this actually means to NOAA. Let's say that NOAA is given 4,000 units per month as a basic income. Let's also say that State X defines that a citizen's current account can hold a maximum of six times the basic income, and that any digital coin on that current account has a lifespan of six months. So if NOAA doesn't spend any money, and if she doesn't move any money to her savings account, all units older than six months will automatically be eliminated from NOAA's current account. Now let's say that during this time, NOAA sells some clothes to a friend. That extra profit will push her current account to the limit, spilling the excess amount into her savings account. Unlike current accounts, savings accounts freeze money's lifespan, and NOAA can move money into it at any time. But savings accounts also have a limit, and once that threshold is met, the excess is pushed into a public money pool that can be used to fund collective projects. This collective pool is also capped. The reason why all these accounts are limited is to ensure that there's never an excess supply of money, which would lead to an unrestrained rise of prices. This model significantly reduces the need for taxes, but it doesn't completely eliminate it. So if necessary, to ensure some income to public departments, states can directly tap into citizens' current accounts and pull a small fee from their basic income. The model is therefore designed to allow participatory budget experiments of different scales, in which citizens can vote how some of their contributions will be spent. 
Unit. This video illustrates how Unit would positively impact various aspects of people's lives. Life with Unit. Unit. Unit is a monetary model designed to be implemented as a public service, but it doesn't prescribe a particular policy regarding other public services. What UNIT does is provide basic income to all citizens and give governments a better way to fund their programs. So for the purpose of illustration only, this video elaborates a scenario in which the government established housing and digital accessibility as part of their public service provision. So let's get started with these examples. Here's Parker a psychologist in training that works for the National Housing Department to ensure everyone can get affordable housing. Her job is to identify homeless citizens and onboard them to the free housing program, and that's how she met Howard. Howard had no source of income, but when he met Parker, she told him that since the introduction of UNIT, citizens are entitled to basic income, and if they wished, that they could also live in a small affordable apartment. She offered to guide him through the process, and Howard agreed. The simplest way to register Howard was to give him a smartphone so he could access UNIT's app. So Howard was given a phone with unlimited data and a list of available apartments, and it didn't take much time for Howard to choose a house and get settled in. So let's meet Manu now. He works as a business trainer helping sole traders and companies integrate UNIT into their accounting and financial planning. One of Manu's clients is Lee, a full-stack developer that works as a sole trader. It's a highly skilled job and there's plenty of demand, so Lee's steady income flow allowed her to reach the maximum amount in her savings account. That's when she sought out Manu's expertise. Manu informed Lee that if she were to find a coworker, the company's savings account would increase so they could accumulate more money. So Lee, knowing this, hired Khadija. Alone, Lee was limited to a personal account, a personal savings account, and a company current and savings account. With Khadija, their company accounts doubled, and if Lee and Khadija reach the new limit, they can always hire more people. There's another story going on. Manu and Parker are actually partners and both are employed, so they managed to save money from their work income. But when they had a baby, they decided to take a break from their jobs to devote all attention to the family. So although their total income was reduced, they could still face expenses. Because they had savings, both are given a basic income and free access to public services. Parker and Manu are well set to take care of the baby and support each other during the early stages of their parenthood. Unito. Besides the stories, the overall benefits extend across many aspects of our society. From mitigating inequality to allowing for participatory budgets, UNIT would even leave us equipped to deal with pandemics without the risk of inflation. I've asked some people what they would do if they would be given a basic income. What would you do if you'd be given a regular basic income? I actually put 100% of my effort and time into all of my creative pursuits, my music. I make a lot of paintings, yeah. focus on my artwork. Well, I work in education, so it would be related to that, but maybe less, uh, less within the structures, so maybe do something myself or like take a bit more risks because there's less uh, uh, depending on it. And study more, collaborate more, uh, spend less time constraining my anxieties. I don't have any dependents, I'm married, I don't have any kids, I just quit my job and I'd work at home on personal projects. That's what I'd be doing. I've got a bunch of projects that I'm funding myself, games that I'm building. Invest in trying to buy property. Like, I just keep going back and I just want a home that's actually mine, that I can call a home. I don't think that I would change any, anything that I'm already doing. So I have um, two jobs, I'm working as a, a tailor and as a research assistant. And I love my jobs, but like I would also like be able to maybe, you, you know, volunteer more. It wouldn't change my everyday life, it would just take some edge off of it. I would simply go and travel around, um, go and see new cultures and just have, live. Uh, retire. Don't, don't you like your job? I do love my job. So why would you retire? Uh, because there is also an awful lot of things I would like to do while I still have my health. UNIT would allow for most of this. And it would also allow going from a country where 11 million Brits can't afford the dentist to one where they can. Such model wouldn't go unnoticed, but even at a small scale, the task is monumental, which brings us back to the nature of this project. This was set as a speculative design project because there was really no other way to frame it from the get-go. But in all honesty, the objective was never to design a monetary model for utopia, 
And that's why during this process, I've kept a live website to prototype with partners, specialists, casual visitors, exposing the process, looking for constant criticism. This allowed me to both test and explain the model. I've ran collaborative design exercises like a mirror board to expose units key concepts and collaborate with a mathematician to arrive to the UBI premium equations. I've also done a mirror board with other designers to give shape to units inflation control mechanisms. And there's also a mini game in which people are asked to build their own nations. More than just providing me with quantitative data, this is revealing itself as a good didactic instrument to explain units mechanisms and get qualitative feedback. One of the most important outcomes is the book that exposes the theory and mechanisms of unit. I've also published a paper on the Journal of Accounting and Finance where I make the case for the integration of design in monetary theory and practice, claiming economics back into the rich grounds of humanities and creative disciplines. As I said before, the objective was never to design a monetary model for utopia. The problem with our central banks is very real, and to frame it, we need more than one lens. As a final thought, I hope that GUNIT will start contributing to the debates, the monetary one and the service design one.